Hi, I'm Lauren Smith, and you are tuned in to Weird Realities, my go-to place for all the news of the strange and unusual. So grab your tinfoil hat, because it's about to get weird. You're listening to Weird Realities, the destination of choice for those inquisitive minds seeking to find that special place where myth, science, history, and folklore intersect, where we interview authors, podcasters, content creators, and filmmakers to discuss their work and projects, as well as dive deep into the weird things that capture our imaginations and stimulate our minds. Weird Realities is a Nightcaller's production made possible by Lauren Smith Producer, with audio and visual by Beaverhook Productions. Hello and welcome to Weird Realities. This is Hadley Thorne, author of the Tapestry of World series. I am happy to welcome you to today's Weird Ink session, where I am speaking with author and podcaster marty ving hey marty how are you how are you feeling today hey i'm doing really good thank you how are you pretty good it's great to hear your voice again i know same (laughs) (laughs) so i i'm on your um facebook group and i've noticed that there are a tons of changes going on what's happening in your world yes so um i basically my journey to self-publishing was kind of a long and winding road. And I think I've basically been figuring things out as I went. And one of the things that I did, I made a mistake that a lot of people do, which is try to chase trends and do what they think is uh, marketable at that moment instead of sticking to what they love and writing to that market. So I, my original um, market that I was in was thrillers. Like I loved thrillers. I've always loved them. I've always loved horror. And I kind of tried to make myself fit into like a box that I thought people would like. And now I'm kind of rebranding, going back to my roots with the thrillers and the horror and stuff like that. So that's kind of, kind of what all's going on with that. <laughs> Well, I'm super excited to hear that. Um, I love horror. I love thrillers. And I think that that's a great fit for you. Yes. <laughs> so let me start with the Eerie Oki podcast. All right. Because that's been hugely successful for you. Mm-hmm. And how did you get started with that? Okay. So it's kind of funny because I started the podcast. I I knew that I needed, if I was going to go the self-publishing route, I needed some sort of platform because I really didn't have anything. I would had an author page for a while and like all I'd really shared to it is about going to thriller fest, all that, whatever. And I was like, I really need something that kind of ties into what I'm wanting to write, which is at that time was horror thriller, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, I decided I was going to do a podcast because I tried creating a YouTube video first and I was going to do a YouTube channel and after about two minutes of trying to edit video of myself, I was like, no, this is not for me. I do not enjoy this very much <laughs> at all. Like, I, I think I can deal with hearing my own voice. I don't think I can watch myself. So I decided, okay, I'm going to do a podcast. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to make it about. And at the time, um, one of my favorite podcasts was Last Podcast on the Left. And I still love them. And um And I knew that true crime and stuff was popular. And it was something that I had always loved. Like when I was in high school, way back in like 2003 to 2005, um, I was the weird kid that was carrying around the true crime books. Like, you know, the stranger beside me about Ted Bundy and then like the serial killer encyclopedia. And I was always into ghosts and paranormal stuff and and horror. Like I loved horror movies. And so it just sort of... um, coalesced really well, like right at the right moment. And I think one of the reasons that it has been successful is because it filled a void that was not filled at the time, I think, like, which was a podcast like last podcast on the left, but on a local scale for Oklahoma. Cool. Excuse me. So let me see. You've got a history with ghosts and paranormal. I hear there's something about a spider I need to ask you about. A spider? Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm trying to think. It says, ask her about the giant spider apparition she encountered. Um, That's from our friend Lauren. Giant spider. <laughs> gosh. I, I had a hallucination one time that I saw a spider that was tap dancing. <laughs> But that was not, um, it may have been, I'm not really sure. I cannot remember. 
what that is. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's probably the tap dancing spider. Probably, yeah. <laughs> that was that was actually due to a sleeping medication that I was taking, and that was horrifying because that tap that tap dancing spider was on top of the bathroom door, and I thought it was real. And I had just been reading Cirque de Freak by Darren Chan, which if you haven't read those books, they're super fun. It's basically like a young adult slash middle grade uh, vampire story about a circus, and they made a movie of the first book. But um, there's a tap dancing spider in it, so that is what. I saw and it scared me <laughs> to death. Like, oh my gosh, it scared me so bad. And I was like, okay, so this medication is not right for me. Um, we're going to get that sorted. <laughs> yeah. Um, I took some sleeping medication once when I'd had surgery and it was not for me. I think I was dreaming while I was half of mm -hmm. my brain was still awake. Mm -hmm. um, my mom, when she had her knee replacement, um, they put her on pain pills, obviously, like after the surgery and everything. And when she got to come home, I think that those pain pills messed with her REM sleep or something because she's never done this before and she's never done it since. But while she was on those, she would be like halfway between asleep and awake and she would be using her hands like she was counting something. Like as she was falling asleep and she'd have her hands up in the air, like she was sorting or counting something. And it was the same thing every time. So I think that I definitely think that medications can affect people different ways and make stuff like that happen. Definitely. So I hear ghosts are a good topic. Yes. So tell me about your ghostly experiences. Um. So I probably... I remember when I was a kid, I always loved horror movies and I always loved spooky stuff. And I was always like, like, I remember being in grade school and hearing about like Bloody Mary and stuff like that. And I was like, oh yeah, that is cool. Cool, cool, cool. Tight, tight, tight. I want to learn all about that. And I read like Vanicula and Goosebumps and Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark and um, watched Are You Afraid of the Dark? I loved all that stuff. And that sort of, as I got older, kind of translated into an interest in the paranormal. And I actually have, I'm not sure that this is a story that I've actually ever shared on Irioki. I might have, but um, so one of the most paranormal things I've ever experienced in my entire life. Um, so my dad died in 2006. He died a couple days after Christmas and he was in the hospital on a ventilator. And Leading up to his death was a really traumatic time, like of him getting sick and going into the hospital and coming out and going back in and then not coming off the ventilator and um, then him ultimately dying. And on the night that we pretty much knew was going to be it, my mom sent me home because she was like, I don't want you to be here when it happens. I want you to go home. I was about 19. And I was like, okay. So I'd been up for probably 36 hours. I mean, I was... I was sleep deprived and I've always been a person that whenever I need to crash, I crash hard and for a really long time. And so I went home, it was about two o'clock in the morning and this was way back in the day before like the Motorola Razor. I had one of those blue Motorola curved phones that was the stylish thing at the time. And I set it on either the bed beside me or the nightstand beside my bed because I wanted to have it in case my mom called or anything. And um, I fell asleep. It's about two o'clock in the morning and I woke up and it was, I grabbed my phone as soon as I woke up to see if she had called. She hadn't, but I saw the time and the time said 5 25 AM. And I thought that was kind of weird because I hadn't really slept that long, which not entirely weird given everything that was going on. You know, I probably was in a little bit of shock and stuff. And anyway, it said 5 25 AM and this feeling just kind of washed over me. I knew he was gone. I knew he had died. And I, and it was this feeling that it was like him, but just saying I'm okay. And this sense of peace kind of washed over me, like relief for everything that we had been dealing with for like the last however long. And I know that a lot of people are always ashamed to admit that relief is one of the first things that they feel when someone passes, especially after a lengthy illness. But that is for anybody who's wondering, that is very normal. That is a oh, totally, yeah. yeah, human reaction. Like it doesn't mean that you love them any less, anything like that. And I felt that like sense of peace and relief. And it was not just relief for me and my mom. It was like relief for him. Like I knew he was wherever he was, he was okay. And so I laid there for a little bit. I got up cause I knew my mom was going to be home. She hadn't called me or anything. And she showed up about 30 minutes, 30 minutes later. 
And she walked in the door and she had the hospital bag with his clothes in it. And she said, he's gone. And she always thought it was weird because I hugged her and I said, I know. And so later that day, we go to the funeral home to get everything set up. And we're sitting there, you know, talking to the funeral director. And he is going through the death certificate stuff to get it all confirmed before he like submits it. And um, he says, time of death is listed as uh, 525 a.m. Is that correct? And I just sat there. I didn't say anything because I was just like, kind of, I was in shock, number one, from my dad dying. And number two, it was kind of like, I really hadn't thought about the time being significant until that moment. And I was just sitting there and I didn't say anything. I was just like, wow, okay, that's just one more surreal thing to add to today. And it, it is definitely one of the biggest paranormal experiences that I've ever had. And I think it was, um, I definitely think that something was happening. Like, I don't know what it was, but I don't know if that's just that parent child connection or what, but I definitely think there was something kind of paranormal to that. Uh, definitely. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, I went through two parents on hospice and it's, first off, it is a relief and it's something mm -hmm. that, people will not understand until they go through it themselves, no. but it's, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of emotions all tied up and oh, all yeah. that. And I know when my mom passed, it was here at my house with me and mm -hmm. it, it's just, you could just tell, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yes. And I'm a firm believer in there is a place that we all go to after we pass and mm -hmm. it's a beautiful place. And mm -hmm. I think both of them are done suffering and they're, they're, yep. they're doing oh, good. Yeah. I totally, I, I totally agree with that. Cause I'm, I'm kind of at this place in my life where I, I think I've neglected my spirituality for a long time. I had some negative experiences growing up with like ultra, um, conservative Christian kind of not my upbringing, but kind of the periphery of my family. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a pretty negative experience for me. And I know a lot of people have a ne negative experience like that, especially growing up in the Bible belt where that's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, there's a Walgreens and a CVS on every corner, but in the Bible belt, there's a church there too. Yeah. <laughs> there's one on every corner and, you know, and, um, and I know that that's not everyone's experience. Some people have a really great relationship with that kind of, religion and spirituality, but um, I think I kind of stepped away for a long time because I was just sort of like burnt out and jaded, you know? Well, I've done a lot of research into various religions and I can say this, I believe that God speaks to us all on, mm -hmm. in the way in which connects with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why some people will convert to a different religion, why mm -hmm. some people walk away from the church and turn to another type of spirituality or mm -hmm. you know, just take comfort in a personal relationship with God. But I think oh, yes. that I think it's very personal. And I think that, um, you know, we all just have to do what's right for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I think I went through a period like after my dad died where I was just really angry at the whole world and the whole universe and at God and whatever. And, I just sort of rejected all of that. And it's been lately that I don't know if it's, I, I think part of it is the podcast, like um, kind of exposing me to a lot more of these stories and stuff. And in some ways I've grown more skeptical of some things, but in other ways it's kind of made me wonder, you know, we know so very little and there's so much out there that we don't know. Like, um, you know, like the oceans are only mapped to a certain degree, you know, and we, we feel like we're at this height of technology and everything. And there are still things that we, we don't know. We don't know where the universe ends, you know, like it, it's, it's crazy, the stuff that we don't know. And I think that really, it's weird because I think that science has brought me back to spirituality. Oh yeah. Um, I think, I think that it does. And I think our experiences shape us into, you know, what's going to work for us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So let me ask you this, these experiences that you've had personally and your podcast, has that impacted your writing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, 
it's kind of funny because <laughs> the other night I was over at my aunt's house and they were all talking to me and I had a couple of beers and I've been watching what I eat really good. So those two beers hit me a lot harder than they usually do. <laughs> and so I was just talking up a storm and uh, one of my aunts asked me who a certain character in one of my novels was based on. And I told her, like, I told her who it was. It's somebody that she actually knows. And, you know, I was, she was just like, wow, you know, and my things like it, my experiences have always, and I think that a lot of writers are like this too. They play into characters, they play into themes and stuff like that. And um, my Blair Graves series, the newest series that I'm working on, um, the father character in that is definitely based off of my dad because uh, my dad and I had, you know, uh, we had a pretty stormy relationship. We did not always get along. We very, very infrequently got along actually. Like we butted heads a lot and it wasn't until I got older after he had passed away and stuff that I realized a lot of that is because we were very similar and um, we had a lot more in common probably than me and my mom do. And that I, I always think about that scene in Six Feet Under the TV. Did you ever see that show? I did. It was a good one. Oh, gosh, it's so good. It's excellent. If you're listening out there and you've never seen it, go do yourself a favor. Get a month long subscription to HBO Max and watch that. It is it is excellent. And there's <laughs> one episode where Claire, the youngest child, is talking about their father who dies at the very beginning of the show. And she says, I wish I had known him as an adult. And I've always related to that. And that's kind of what this Blair Graves thing is about because in the book, her father goes missing and seven years later, he's declared legally dead. And so she is kind of left in this uh, weird like limbo state where she's trying to figure out who she is, but she doesn't want to be wrapped up in who he was because he was a late night paranormal radio host. And she thinks that's all he did it for money, like whatever. And, um, so my relationship with my dad has definitely informed that dynamic in that book. Um, Cause after my dad died, I was very, I was angry at him. I was very angry at him. And um, cause he died young and he died um, as a result of things that he didn't necessarily need to die from that would have been within his control. And so that was, that's kind of something that even though in the book, her dad goes missing, it's his active choice to leave and so it's kind of definitely, definitely informed by my experiences. And I feel like um, with the Irioki short reads that I do, I draw a lot from the podcast on that. Like I, um, and I draw a lot from Oklahoma, like in the first volume, there's a story called Jaws that is about a vampire and it is set in the tunnels down beneath uh, Oklahoma City downtown, which a lot of people don't even know that there are tunnels down there and you can walk through them, but there are. And back in the 80s, um, they used to have bars and stuff down there, actually. It's not as exciting now. It's it's like they've renovated it a little bit because it got kind of sketchy for a while. It was like you didn't go down there after 5 p.m. for quite a while. And um, they took all the bars out and the cafes and stuff. But you can walk down there now and it's a lot nicer. But um like there's that. And then I, I've tried to use things that I've learned through my research in those stories, um, which has been really, really, really fun. But yeah, so I would say just about everything I write has an element of truth to it. And let me ask you this. You do write nonfiction and fiction, correct? Um, I blog a little bit, but I mainly write fiction. Okay. I, I'm confused. I thought at one time that you had said that you did some books that you put on the your podcast for sale? Um, I don't think so. Um, I've never done any nonfiction aside from ghostwriting that I did years ago. Okay. Maybe I'm just confused. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I have thought about doing some nonfiction, like podcasting stuff, like maybe a guide or something like that. So I may have mentioned that. Yeah. You, you'd be awesome at it. I know you've helped Thank me you. a lot. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, for those out there who don't know, Marnie is a good friend of Lauren and she has helped me a lot with both self-publishing and podcasting. So. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. You, I'm so glad that we connected and I just really enjoy talking to you and you keep me inspired all the time. You and Lauren both. Well, I think that it is a great tribe of strong women that we have for sure. Yes. Yes. So tell me about these Blair books. Um, so basically the, uh, the tagline for it is pretty much uh, the X-Files meets Supernatural. 
And it's Blair Graves is um, the main character and her father, Graham Graves, went missing seven years prior to the opening of the first novel. And he's being declared dead legally. Um, and it's something that she has not really faced. Like she's always kind of um, pretended that she was okay with him being gone, that he went missing. And it was probably on one of his wacky research trips and he ran into the wrong kind of people. And, you know, she's, she's always pushed it down and kind of made herself out to be really tough. And like, it doesn't bother her at all that he's gone. And when he's legally declared dead, it kind of shifts everything for her um, into, wow, this, this is a lot more real than him just being gone. And, um, and she's not really ready to admit that to herself, but in the book, so his, his career was, he was a paranormal late night radio host and he made quite a bit of money with that. And she has a brother that, um, is a twin. And at the beginning of the novel, um, he is in financial trouble, which he very often is and will be throughout the series. And she realizes that she needs to sell her father's house um, that she's been living in so that she can give Blake some of the money and bail him out one more time. And so she sells their house and she ends up buying a fixer upper that's a historical home in Oklahoma. And when she starts in on the renovations, um, that's when things start to get kind of weird and she's never believed in ghosts. She's never believed in anything paranormal. She thinks it's all just uh, a, a, a scam. Like she thinks her dad and people like us, you know, just talk about this stuff to talk to vulnerable people and things like that. That's kind of her mindset. And um, then stuff happens in her own house. And so she's like, okay, this is a little bit weird. And she reaches out to a guy in Oklahoma that is a YouTuber who does this stuff for a living. And his name is Cash Kelly, and he's very handsome and very tall. And he comes to the house and he tells her, you know, I'll do what I can for you, you know, whatever. And they develop a friendship and she kind of softens a little bit towards him and towards the fact that maybe her dad wasn't such a bad guy. And that's kind of where the first novel goes, basically. And well, I'm hooked. Oh, thank, you. Right now. <laughs> thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you. So I'm working on the second one. I'm about halfway done with it. And it, th the first one is called the haunting of Solomon house. And the second one is called the Holloway hoax and it deals with Bigfoot. So that's been a really fun, fun one to be working on. So yeah. I bet. Um, mm -hmm. The last time we spoke, you were writing a novel that what had something to do with a tiger. Cause I remember you yes. were researching tigers. What yes. happened with that? Okay. So I am still working on that. I actually finished, I'm in the process of finally like doing the final edit on the reader magnet for that, which is a prequel to the novel. And, um, basically, uh, so a lot of the time what happens for me is like real life stories will inspire a novel that I want to write. And so like, um, trying to think, okay. So the book I wrote, the way it ends, um, that was kind of inspired. I don't remember. I don't know if you remember this guy, but there was a guy who he'd been on Oprah a few times. He was like a meditation guru and he would hold these retreats out in the desert where he would um, get people in this sweat lodge and wouldn't let them come out because it was like a character building, like push yourself to the limit kind of thing. And finally, one time, three people died, people who had asked to leave that he would not let out. And so he ended up going to prison over it. And he had kind of this cult-like following. And in the documentary about him, even after he gets out of prison, you can tell he doesn't think he did anything wrong. Like he does not see what was wrong with what he did at all. And um, that kind of led me into like cult territory. And I watched uh, Wild Wild Country and I watched um, some other stuff and I read some stuff about cults and um, so the way it ends is basically like informed by that guy's story kind of, but also some other stuff and, um, this tiger novel. So I went to the bookstore and I found this book called no beasts so fierce and it's by Dane Hucklebridge and it's about the man eating tiger of Champawat. I don't know if that's how you actually say it. It's probably not. Um, but I believe that was n as a city in Nepal. It's like on the border between, uh, Tibet and India, I believe. So, um, or where, wherever that is, that borderland. So, um, this tiger at the turn of the century, like back in 19, 1900s, um, it killed 
over 430 people and eight. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. So one of the fascinating things to me about the story, I've always been fascinated by man eating animals. Like I was obsessed with the ghost in the darkness as a kid. And if you haven't seen that, got to go see it or got to look it up on IMDb or something. Cause I think it's free everywhere now. It's such a good movie. Like it's, <laughs> it is. it's it such is. a good movie. Oh my gosh. Such a cool story too. Um, but one of the things about that is a lot of people believe that John Henry Patterson in that story embellished a lot of what happened. And the thing about the man eater of Champawat is Jim Corbett, the guy who was called to dispatch the tiger. He was a really interesting guy because he was very humble and he took absolutely no pleasure in killing man eaters. He thought it was a very sad affair because usually something, um, something that I didn't know is that man eaters are not born. They are made and they are made by men. And what I mean by that is usually the animal has suffered a life-threatening injury at the hands of people. Um, its environment has been encroached upon massively, re reducing its hunting territory. And it seems like there's one other factor that is escaping me right now, but those are the two main ones. And so like if a tiger is shot and it loses part of its jaw, it's not going to be as easy to catch something that is designed to outrun it. It's going to be a whole lot easier to sneak up on a person that's carrying water back to their village. Right. And so they just sort of naturally figure that out that, Hey, these bipedal things are way easier prey than the stuff that's in the jungle. You know, <laughs> these, land, like, these land monkeys. They exactly. Can't move fast. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. They can't move fast. They don't move fast at all. So this is, this is good. I, this is good, good eating. And so um, that tiger kill, uh, killed and ate 437 people, I believe, um, before Jim Corbett uh, dispatched it. And he was called in to do it. He was a British man that was born in India. And something that I found really interesting in my research is that if you were British and you were born in India, other British people who came to India looked down on you because you weren't rich enough to go back and be born in England and then come back to India. So that was, there was this whole, like, not only were they horrible to the native people, but they were also horrible to British people who were born there. There was a lot of classism and racism and stuff like that. And um, anyway, he was one of the people that was poor and he was born in India and he grew up with a lot of the Indian hunters. And so they really like trusted him. They'd known him their whole life. They'd always worked together and, that was one of the reasons that he was always called whenever there was a man eater, he was, uh, he would be sent to go and take care of it. Like he actually killed a leopard also um, and several other animals. And then he devoted like the latter part of his life to tiger conservation because he knew that the British Raj was kind of responsible for tigers going extinct. Like they would have these hunts where they would kill like 175 tigers in an afternoon. And it was all about, you know, let's, let's catch these wild animals in the subcontinent that we don't have back home and kind of make a mark for ourselves sort of a thing. And so he devoted his life to that afterwards and he never took any pleasure in killing a tiger, even a man eater. And he was just very humble and very grounded and really interesting guy. And that's kind of reading that story of him and this tiger was the inspiration for the novel that I'm working on now. And the reader magnet that I just finished is a prequel novella or short story kind of between those links. And it's about uh, the main character is a girl named Amelia Karnak. And she is a British person born in India to her father, who is sort of based on Jim Corbett. And he is known for hunting man-eating tigers and all this, that, and the other. And the twist though, in this story is that Amelia as a woman growing up in turn of the century, India doesn't want the traditional life that a woman is supposed to have. She wants to hunt like her father. And so there's a lot of like tension there with her not doing what she is quote unquote supposed to. And a lot of tension with her older brother who has never been as good of a shot as she is. And she's always been their father's favorite. And so there's a lot of like family dynamics going on. And um, in the prequel, when she's a little girl, you kind of get to see where the man eater that is starring in the novel comes from. So um, that's, that's been really, really fun to kind of play with. But yeah. Well, 
It sounds great. I know you Thank do a you. lot of character development, and I yes. love that. So Thank you. I'm Thank gonna you. have to dive in. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll let you know when I uh, get the reader magnet out there. It should be coming out this week. So yeah, let me know and I will be happy to promote it across all our social awesome. media. Awesome. Thank you. But I'm just, you got so much going on, girl. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. Like it is, I feel so busy right now. Like it's crazy, but I've always done better when I'm busy, like my mood and stuff and my mental health. I do so much better when I, when I keep myself busy. So I understand that. It's something it's something cathartic about you just um going from one project to the next. Yes. Sure. Yeah, and I think it I think it helps you keep momentum when you kind of have something waiting in the wings to work on so that you don't have to edit a project fresh. You have something that you can write on for a while before you go back and edit that other project. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, let me ask you this. This okay. is one of my favorite things. This is where the, the whole idea of weird realities came from is my friend Gracie and I used to sit around and we would talk about the weird stuff that inspired us. So you're telling me about the tigers and all. And I just have to say like your first book, what was the inspiration for it? Oh gosh. Okay. So my first book. Um, so the first one I ever wrote. Yes. Okay. So that one was inspired by a lot of stuff that had happened to me personally. And that book is never going to see the light of day because it was, it was basically a, um, it was super cathartic for me. It was something that I needed to do on several levels. Um, so when I was, and you can edit this out if this is something that you don't want me to share, but um, when I was 20, I was sexually assaulted and it sort of steered the course of my twenties for me. And I ended up being diagnosed as bipolar and having PTSD and like all this stuff. And for quite a while there, it was basically like trauma and grief and just one thing after another. And um, the first novel that I completed was based on that experience. And um, it was highly cathartic for me to write it because it was not only based on that, but it was also based on some abusive things that I had experienced as well. And um, it's the one that I took to New York City. But um, writing that was a huge thing for me because not just the catharsis of putting those things on paper and like mentally getting my revenge kind of thing and like finding my voice again, but it was huge because up until that point, I had tried and tried and tried to write something long form. I'd written short stories. I'd written fan fiction. I had never completed anything especially anything as large as a novel. And I just decided, um, this was at a point where I kind of, I'd realized how unhappy I was. And I just decided one day, I was like, I'm gonna do it. I'm, I'm gonna write every day for the next six months and I'm gonna write a novel and I don't care if it's horrible, I'm going to finish it. And some days I would literally stare at the screen and I would write a sentence and that would be it for that day. Other days it would be thousands of words. Like it was just kind of hit or miss. And I just kept going because I was like, I have to do this. I don't know why, but I have to do this. And when I finished that, it had been such a long-term dream of mine to have written a novel. It opened up a whole world of possibilities for me, not only creatively, but personally, because I had, when I was dealing with all the PTSD and the bipolar disorder and all of that, um, and I still deal with that too, but um, when it was bad and it was, I was in my illness, um, I, you know, like, oh gosh, hang on. I lost my train of thought. Lost my train of thought. Hang on. <laughs> Let me see. Okay. So um, that had been like a long-term goal of mine. And when I, when I was in my illness, I had dropped out of college and gone back several times and it just never stuck. Like I could never get myself to finish a semester or graduate from college. And I really thought I'm never going to graduate from college. I'm just never going to do it. And before my grandpa died, what his dying wish was for me to finish college and graduate and get my degree because he had not finished college and he always wanted that for me. And I was just like, I can't do it. And then when I finished that novel, I thought that was really, really hard. And I did it. And I thought, college has been really, really hard, but I wonder if I can do it. And so I went back and I finished college. I got my degree and it was between college and finishing that novel. I went to New York city and I pitched my novel to a bunch of agents. I went to thriller fest and they have a thing there that's very famous called pitch fest. And basically um, 
it is the most high pressure scenario I can possibly imagine for a writer because you're in a room with like two to 300 other people and there are agents at tables and you get in line right behind a person who is sitting down talking to them and you have two minutes to convince them to let you send them your book to read. And they either say yes or they say no. And you get up and you go find another table to stand in line at. And it lasts for like three hours, I think. I did the whole three hours. I got to sit with eight agents. I pitched my novel. Seven of them agreed to read it. Um, I got really good feedback from a lot of them. Like they said, this, they were, a lot of the, the verdict was kind of, you know, the market is saturated with domestic thrillers right now. And, um, but this novel is really good and we want to see what you do next and continue your pursuit of publication. And so I did, I mean, I, I, can, I pursued that for quite a while, but I mean, finishing that first novel was very huge for me because it kind of, it was one of the first things that allowed me to see myself in an entirely different light than I'd seen myself for probably a decade. Well, girl, you are a warrior. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You are too. Well, to hear your story and to know where you've been and what you've mm. come through and it's, it's just inspiring. It's kind it of, a, it's, it, it is, it's really hard to wrap my mind around sometimes because in 2019, when I launched the podcast, it, um, it felt like my life went from me being a hermit to it just like shooting off like a rocket, like fireworks in the sky. And it was, it was really overwhelming. And that whole first year and most of last year, I struggled a lot with imposter syndrome and just feeling like I didn't really know what I was doing and that it, at any moment someone was going to find out and they were going to find out that I was a total idiot and I didn't know what I was doing or anything like that. And, um, I finally gotten to the point where I'm like, no, this is what I do. And I'm, I'm all right at it. And it's, you know, it's all good and everything like that. And, um, but it is, it's weird because I was in therapy a couple of weeks ago and I just broke down crying because my therapist was like, I just want you to realize that your life right now, this is you happy. And, um, I just cried because I told her, I said, I really never thought I'd get here. And I, even though I never thought it would happen, I never gave up on it either. So. Well, I'm so happy that you are in a good place. Thank you. But I'll tell you, girl, you've been through it for sure. <laughs> I have. I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's, I think that's one of the things I like about being around creative people is mm -hmm. we are a bunch of damaged people for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And yeah we're able to create something from that. Yes. Yeah. I think it's kind of like that um, Ernest Hemingway quote about like writing is easy. All you do is sit down at the typewriter and bleed. Yeah. Yeah. That's the truth. Yes. Yeah. And I, and, and on the, uh, there's, there's this uh, quote from R.L. Stein. Um, I really enjoy him because he, he does not take writing very seriously. He takes it seriously. It's his career, but He's not one of those people that um, is pretentious or tries to make you feel like if you don't do it a certain way, then you're not doing it right. And um, he he just cracks me up because he one time said he was like, nothing I write comes from the deepest, darkest corners of my heart. He was like, everything I write is for fun. And I just really loved that kind of counterpoint to, you know, the sort of, cause I, I, I write from my pain a lot. Like I mm -hmm. do that a lot. <laughs> and, um, cause that's just what works for me. I, I feel like they say, write what you know. And I think what I know is suffering, <laughs> so <laughs> you know, but. Well, it's a shame that we have to suffer to, to create the stuff. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I know for me personally, there's nothing I would change because I feel like I understand things so much better and I'm able to get to a place where I understand where the characters are coming from with mm -hmm. certain things. Yeah, I get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think that going through the things that you and I have both been through, um, it softens you in a way that you are able to empathize with a broader group of people. And I think that that only helps you as a writer to yeah. be able to empathize with just about anyone. Well, and as, as a reader, 
for mm-hmm. me to be able to feel what a character is feeling is very mm-hmm. important. And that's all oh, yes. the author. Yes. You know? um, I read a lot because, you know, I'm, I deal with a lot of authors on the show. Mm-hmm. And um, I've just, for me, what makes a book is the character development. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love, love, love. That's my favorite thing about uh, Six Feet Under is the character development. Like you go from loving certain characters to hating them and you go from hating certain characters to loving them. And I feel like Shit's Creek is the same way. Like the character development in that, even though it's a sitcom, is fantastic. And I think that's the kind of those character arcs are what you remember like that. It makes you feel something. Yeah. And you remember that feeling. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So what would you say is your creative kryptonite? <sighs> my phone. My phone. <laughs> Absolutely. Like I, I get so distracted by my phone that I cannot have it around whenever I'm trying to write. Like it is that. And um, I need to write every day because not because like every word that I write is worth publishing, but because writing is so intrinsic to who I am that I need to do that to feel good. Like my therapist and I have talked about it and I do all the basic things to take care of myself, to make me feel like a human. And I write to make me feel like myself. So that's kind of, if I don't write every day, like I get in a bad mood, I don't feel good. And as many times as I've been through it, I don't figure it out for a few days. I'm like, why am I in such a bad mood? Why do I hate everything right now? Why do I, why am I done with everything? (laughs) And then I'm like, oh, you haven't written in about a week. So that probably has something to do with it, girlfriend. (laughs) I understand because every moment I'm not writing, I feel like I should be. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I've written a little in the last week, but for Mm -hmm. the most part, since the middle of May, I haven't, I've been podcasting so hard. Mm -hmm. I haven't been writing. Oh, I get that. We've been working on a bunch of stuff around the house this past week and I haven't written. And so it's kind of like, I'm really excited about the stuff we've done around the house, but I'm so like down about not writing that I'm in this weird, like emotional place right now. And I'm like, I don't like this. This is chaotic. (laughs) Like, I don't like how this feels. (laughs) Well, so I definitely get that. So when is your next book launch happening? Um, The next book launch, there probably will be one between now and then of something else. But definitely October is going to be when the Tiger historical thriller is going to come out, the full length novel. So and the reader magnet should be out um, this week. So. Oh, cool. Well, again, let me know and I'm going to send it everywhere. I totally will. And it's going to be free. So anybody that wants it, you can just grab it for free. Cool. So um, what is your writing process when you're actually in the middle of a novel like? Um, so it's kind of it's kind of funny because it has changed over time. And each type of project is a little bit different. Um I like to outline. I enjoy outlining, but if I'm working on like a novella, I usually don't outline it. I'd usually just kind of go with the flow and see what happens and then heavily edit later. But um, I love to have an outline because I am, I love being meticulous about my plot and the Easter eggs that I leave within the story. Uh huh. Um, so that's kind of a, a thing that I really love. But when, when I write, um, so something I've been doing recently, not this week since I've been working on the house, but I love Chris Fox's system of 5,000 words per hour. And the basis of that is not that you sit down for 60 minutes straight and you write 5,000 words. It's that you slowly build a habit of being able to write for longer and longer periods of time until you find your ideal sprint amount of time. So basically what I do is I turn my phone off, leave it in the other room. I, um, make sure I'm not going to be disturbed in any way. If anybody's in the house, I tell them, leave me alone unless you're bleeding or you're on fire. And that's only if the EMTs can't help you. And so (laughs) I'm very like, leave me alone. Like I want to be left alone. And um, I'll set a timer for 15 minutes. I'll open my Scrivener document and I will just write as fast and hard as I can for 15 minutes, not editing a single word, a single misspelling, a single typo, anything. 
And even if I know stuff that is not going to make it is in there, I just keep writing it anyway. And doing that, I've been able to get my word count up to 5,000 words per hour. Um, so I'll do like 15 minutes. If I do four 15 minute sprints, I usually end up with like 5,200 to 5,500 words. And okay. that usually takes me about an hour and a half to two hours, which is not bad at all. Um, but there are people out there who use that method and they, they get 10 K a day easy. Like that's wow. just their, that's their habit. And I'm trying to get to that point. Um, it's kind of hard right now with everything that's going on with the house, but, um, but yeah, I, I really, really like that. I also just like, um, I love having an outline because one of the things about sprinting is if you've got an outline, sprinting is so much easier because you know where you got to go in the next 15 minutes. Like, you know, what's got to happen. And if you got that outline to look at and reference, you can be like, okay, well, X, Y, Z needs to happen. So what needs to happen first? What, who needs to be here? You know, whatever. And you can just kind of go through it. And, um, that has been extremely helpful to me. So Okay. And also, um, a big part of my writing process is uh, music. Like, I, I make a lot of playlists for characters and um, plots. And I, I get a lot same. of, yeah, and I get a lot of inspiration from songs for a plot. And, so. you know, I, I talk to these other um, authors that I'm friends with, and they're, they don't. Really? <laughs> they're like, I need quiet. And I was like, but, but, but. I yeah. have a playlist for every character mm -hmm. and then I have a playlist for the book and right. I try and put the playlist at the end of the book. So if anybody mm -hmm. is curious to what I was listening to when I made it, they can't. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I love that part about it, but that's mm -hmm, so cool too. that you do that. Thank you. I'm glad you do it too. Cause I, uh, I, uh, one of my real good friends, that's also an author, she does it too. So we're not alone. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you what other authors you're friends with. Um, I am friends with uh, Colette Carmen, who writes um, like dark kind of paranormal romance, like dark paranormal romance. And then I'm friends with Marissa Mohi, who has published um, several writing guides and a tarot journal. And I believe that she um, has either already published it or is getting ready to publish her first short story collection. And I'm also friends with Catherine Tratner, who is, uh, she writes fairy tale retellings and she's got several books out there that are very, very good. Um, she just published one called the glass palace and there I'm, I feel very fortunate to have them in my lives. So, well, how do they lift you up to being a better writer? Oh my gosh. So, um, Katie, Catherine, um, she kind of, really got me to get serious about the business side of things. And we have a little group chat that we utilize just about every day for nonsense and also stuff that is, is work related. But um, we, she turned me on to a bunch of like podcasts and Facebook groups that were about the serious side of things. Cause I was just really struggling with that part of it. And I think I kind of kept my head in the sand for a while. Cause I was like, this is overwhelming. I am not a business person. I am a creative. This is all like Greek to me. I don't know what's happening. Like I'd rather just ignore it than like face it and deal with it. And she kind of really got me to look at it. And um, we share resources with each other. Like if we find something that is a news article about what's going on in the indie world, or if we find um, a new service that's being offered by Kindle, like the Kindle Vela, Kindle Vela stuff that's happening. And I know you've got something that's about to come out on that, right? Yes. Yeah. So we, uh, one of the shows that Katie and I both listen to is the sell more books show with Brian Cohen and um, H Claire Taylor. And that is, I highly recommend that to anybody that is getting their feet wet in the indie world. It is full of great information and the way they break it down is like five tips every week. So it's something that if you've only got a few minutes, you'll still get a little nugget of information. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you are being, you're setting things on fire where you're at. You're yeah, setting success you. and your you. inspiration. Like oh, I said, thank you so much. But I just, like I said, I, I'm so glad that Lauren introduced us. I know me too. Now, what advice would you have for someone who's just starting out? Just starting out? Um, I would say 
don't ever let anyone tell you how you're supposed to write or um, that you need to do this or that a certain way. Like, yes, you should, you should learn story structure. Those things are important, but don't let anybody make you feel bad about where you're at on your author journey. Like if they try to put you down because you're just starting or you're quote unquote, just writing fan fiction, don't, don't listen to that. Like um, I would say it, it is something that it is not something that you're born knowing how to do. And anyone who tells you that is full of it. It is a skill that can be learned just like anything else you practice, like playing the piano, um, learning the language. The more you practice, the better you'll get, the easier it'll get, and the more you'll write. And just start and give yourself permission to suck. Like give yourself <laughs> permission to just write stuff that you don't care whether it's good or bad. All that matters is how it makes you feel. I think that's great advice. Mm. Thank you. I wish that I had, I had heard that when I was first getting started. So. Well, I was going to ask you um, as we wrap up today, what would be your advice that you would give to the 20 year old Marnie? Um, gosh, I would tell her, um, keep going. It's going to get a lot better. <laughs> it's going to get a lot better. So do you think that your 20 year old self thought that you would have accomplished this much now? My 20 year old self thought that I would be uh, dead by now. So no, I did, I did not, did not think that. <laughs> so I think, I think uh 20 year old Marnie, I, I think about her a lot and I send her a lot of love because I, that was a rough, rough time. And it gets me really emotional when I think about where I was and where I am and the strength that it took just to stay alive and not end things and, you know, take care of myself enough that my disease didn't get the better of me. And it's just kind of, it's kind of surreal sometimes. So I don't think 20 year old Marnie would even know what to think about all of this. So. Well, girl, I tell you, you are one of the, greatest inspirations in my life and oh my gosh. especially just um knowing you the short time I'm so glad Lauren introduced us and I know that you mean a lot to her too oh when she gosh. first told me about you she she just said you've got to meet this girl she's everything she, that we talk about oh you know, she's, just, she's doing it she's doing it and she's positive and oh my god helps other people and oh know. that makes me feel so good I, that's how I feel about you guys well you know in this in this world that we're in, in the writer community, mm -hmm. you'll meet some people who will bend over backwards to help you and to give you mm -hmm. advice. And then you'll meet people who are just out for themselves. And it's, oh, yeah. And it's yeah. kind of crazy. Um, it is. It is. Good. Something I, something that I think those people who are just out for themselves should keep in mind is that it may seem like the indie author world is big, but it's not. It's, you know, it's kind of, um, people get reputations pretty quickly if they don't do right by people. And I'm not saying that that's the only reason you should do right by people, but I think that, I think you reap what you sow and you just, I, I always look at it as I want to hold the door open for the person behind me. Yes. Like I don't want to slam that door in their face just because I had it hard. doesn't mean the next person needs to have it that hard. Exactly. And I think that's mm -hmm. the way I kind of look at it is, you know, I want to be, I want to be able to help people who by providing them the knowledge and mm -hmm. the opportunities that I didn't have. Exactly. Exactly. And I guess that's, you know, like a, a servant leadership type mentality, mm -hmm. but um, it's just the way that I was raised. It's a Southern way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, I think a lot of that is just like the amount of empathy that you have for other people yeah. and just kind of, you know, you know what it feels like to be a beginner. And you know how lost you can feel and it's anything you can do to help somebody. You feel like I would have wanted somebody to do that for me. Like think about how that would have impacted where I'm at now. And exactly. yeah. So, well, I think about you um, reaching out to me and you giving me some podcasts and some mm -hmm. links to look up and, and some classes to check out. And I mean, that meant the world and it does mean the world. Oh my still. gosh. I'm so glad. I'm so, so glad. I feel like that because um, that Mark Dawson class that I told you about, um, anybody who's listening, he has a $19.99. It's uh, $19.99, not the year 1999. It, it is it is current. Um, it's a course that is about 
building your newsletter, which was like a big stumbling block for me for a long time. And that course absolutely changed everything about that process for me. And that has been incredible. Well, shout out to Mark Dawson. He's the best. Oh, he's the man. He's the man. He's the man. Well, that's great. So how much, how did his course impact you? Did you grow? So, from yeah, I went, uh, so I started in May with the strategies that he advised. And I was also using Book Funnel. Um, which is a great tool for any author out there. You can use it in a lot of different ways. You can deliver um, advanced reader copies uh, uh, securely, and you also don't have to deal with the technical issues. They will handle that for you. Um, and you can offer reader magnets and collect people's email addresses. So one of the things that he talks about in that course is using Facebook ads for reader magnets. And I'd never thought about doing that. And that has worked really well for me between book funnel and Facebook reader magnet ads from the middle of May until now, I went from 48 subscribers to I am at uh, 1,320 now. Holy cow. Yes. So I highly recommend that class and I highly recommend um, Book Funnel. Well, that's awesome. Yes. Well, congratulations. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to see the direction things are going for you. Thank you. And I wish you continued success and of course, you know, you are always welcome here at Weird Realities. Oh my gosh, I would be so excited. And I need to have you on Irioki. Just let me know when. Girl, I will. I will. <laughs> I need to have Lauren back on too. Yeah, she, she's probably more interesting than I am. But Oh my gosh, <laughs> you guys are both phenomenal. Well, but uh, we're doing lots of crazy things here at Weird Realities. And I'd love for you to come participate with some of it. So definitely keep in touch with me. All right. And let me have the um, information for your stuff this week that's coming out mm -hmm. and I'm going to promote it and keep us up to date on your book release. Oh, I will. I will. Well, Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's going to be it for today, guys. And I hope you enjoyed listening and learning from Marnie as much as I have. Um, if you enjoyed the program and you haven't done it already, hit that like button and subscribe to Weird Realities. Turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of the content we are uploading monthly. Until next time, know that the team here at Weird Realities appreciates your support, and we want you to stay weird. That's going to do it, guys. Weird Realities has some great programming coming up, so be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and set your notifications to alert you when we upload new content. Until next time, you can find me on Twitter at Shay underscore Tully, and you can find Hadley at all the usual places, at Hadley Thorne. And you can stay up to date to all of our stuff via Linktree slash Weird Realities. Till next time, stay weird.